Egyptian Jews constitute both one of the oldest and youngest Jewish communities in the world. The historic core of the Jewish community in Egypt consisted mainly of Arabic-speaking Rabbinites and Karaites. After their expulsion from Spain, more Sephardi and Karaite Jews began to emigrate to Egypt and their numbers increased significantly with the growth of trading prospects after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. As a result, Jews from all over the territories of the Ottoman Empire as well as Italy and Greece started to settle in the main cities of Egypt, where they thrived. The Ashkenazi community, mainly confined to Cairo's Darb al Barabira quarter, began to arrive in the aftermath of the waves of pogroms that hit Europe in the latter part of the 19th century. In the late 1950s, Egypt began to expel its Jewish population, estimated at between 75,000 and 80,000 in 1948, also sequestering Jewish owned property at this time. In 2016, an article in an Egyptian periodical contained a quote from Magda Tanya Haroun a spiritual leader of the Jews in Egypt which seemed to imply that there were only six Jews remaining in the entire country, all of them women over age 65. However, a subsequent article in another periodical clarified that she was specifically referring to the Jews remaining in Cairo where she is based and that there are a further twelve Jews in the city of Alexandria, whose spiritual leader is Ben Yusuf Gaon. Topic. Ancient times Topic. Topic. Genesis and Exodus Topic. The Book of Genesis and Book of Exodus describe a period of Hebrew servitude in ancient Egypt, during decades of sojourn in Egypt, the escape of well over a million Israelites from the Delta, and the three-month journey through the wilderness to Sinai. Israelites first appear in the archaeological record on the Merneptah steel from between 1208–3 BCE at the end of the Bronze Age. A reasonably Bible-friendly interpretation is that they were a federation of Habaru tribes of the hill country around the Jordan River. Presumably, this federation consolidated into the Kingdom of Israel, and Judah split from that, during the Dark Age that followed the Bronze. The Bronze Age term, Habaru, was less specific than the Biblical, Hebrew. The term referred simply to Levantine nomads, of any religion or ethnicity. Mesopotamian, Hittite, Canaanite, and Egyptian sources describe them largely as bandits, mercenaries, and slaves. Certainly, there were some Habaru slaves in ancient Egypt, but native Egyptian kingdoms were not heavily slave-based. Later ancient times in the Elephantine papyri, caches of legal documents and letters written in Aramaic amply document the lives of a community of Jewish soldiers stationed there as part of a frontier garrison in Egypt for the Achaemenid Empire. Established at Elephantine in about 650 BCE during Manasseh's reign, these soldiers assisted Pharaoh Semeticus I in his Nubian campaign. Their religious system shows strong traces of Babylonian polytheism, something which suggests to certain scholars that the community was of mixed Judeo-Samaritan origins, and they maintained their own temple, functioning alongside that of the local deity Shnum. The documents cover the period 495 to 399 BCE. The Hebrew Bible also records that a large number of Judeans took refuge in Egypt after the destruction of the Kingdom of Judah in 597 BCE, and the subsequent assassination of the Jewish governor, Gedaliah, 2 Kings 25 verses 22–24, Jeremiah 40 verses 6–8 On hearing of the appointment, the Jewish population fled to Moab, Ammon, Edom and in other countries returned to Judah. Jeremiah chapter 40 verses 11 to 12 However, before long Gedaliah was assassinated, and the population that was left in the land and those that had returned ran away to Egypt for safety. 2 Kings chapter 25 verse 26, Jeremiah chapter 43 verses 5 to 7 The numbers that made their way to Egypt are subject to debate. In Egypt, they settled in Migdal, Topanhes, Noph, and Pathros. Jeremiah chapter 44 verse 1 Ptolemaic and Roman Topic. Further waves of Jewish immigrants settled in Egypt during the Ptolemaic era, especially around Alexandria. Thus, their history in this period centers almost completely on Alexandria, though daughter communities rose up in places like the present Kafr ed Dewar, and Jews served in the administration as custodians of the river. 
As early as the 3rd century BCE, one can speak of a widespread diaspora of Jews in many Egyptian towns and cities. In Josephus history, it is claimed that, after the first Ptolemy took Judea, he led some 120,000 Jewish captives to Egypt from the areas of Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and Mount Gerizim. With them, many other Jews, attracted by the fertile soil and Ptolemy's liberality, emigrated there of their own accord. An inscription recording a Jewish dedication of a synagogue to Ptolemy and Berenice was discovered in the 19th century near Alexandria. Josephus also claims that, soon after, these 120,000 captives were freed of their bondage by Philadelphus. The history of the Alexandrian Jews dates from the foundation of the city by Alexander the Great, 332 BCE, at which they were present. They were numerous from the very outset, forming a notable portion of the city's population under Alexander's successors. The Ptolemies assigned them a separate section, two of the five districts of the city, to enable them to keep their laws pure of indigenous cultic influences. The Alexandrian Jews enjoyed a greater degree of political independence than elsewhere. While the Jewish population elsewhere throughout the later Roman Empire frequently formed private societies for religious purposes, or organized corporations of ethnic groups like the Egyptian and Phoenician merchants in the large commercial centers, those of Alexandria constituted an independent political community, side by side with that of the other ethnic groups. For the Roman period, there is evidence that at Oxyrinchus, modern Beniza, on the west side of the Nile, there was a Jewish community of some importance. Many of the Jews there may have become Christians, though they retained their biblical names e.g. David and Elizabeth, occurring in a litigation concerning an inheritance. There is even found a certain Jacob, son of Achilles c. 300 CE, as beetle of an Egyptian temple. The Hellenistic Jewish community of Alexandria translated the Old Testament into Greek. This translation is called the Septuagint. The translation of the Septuagint itself began in the 3rd century BCE and was completed by 132 BCE, initially in Alexandria, but in time elsewhere as well. It became the source for the Old Latin, Slavonic, Syriac, Old Armenian, Old Georgian and Coptic versions of the Christian Old Testament. The Jewish community of Alexandria was extinguished by Trajan's army during the Quito's War of 115-117 CE, also known as the Diaspora Revolt. The Jewish revolt, which is said to have began in Cyrene and spread to Egypt, was largely motivated by religious zealotry, aggravation after the failed Great Revolt and destruction of the Temple, and anger at discriminatory laws. <inaudible> <inaudible> Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire the greatest blow Alexandrian Jews received was during the Byzantine Empire rule and the rise of a new state religion, Christianity. It was the expulsion of the Jews from Alexandria so-called Alexandria Expulsion in 414 or 415 AD under the leadership of Saint Cyril. The church and state combined to form a totalitarian state religion under the times of Emperor Constantine. Later violence took on a decidedly anti-Semitic context with calls for ethnic cleansing. Before that time, state, religious sanctioned claims of a Jewish pariah were not common. Gibbon in his The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Chapter 47, describes the Alexandria pogrom. Without any legal sentence, without any royal mandate, the patriarch Saint Cyril, at the dawn of day, led a seditious multitude to the attack of the synagogues. Unarmed and unprepared, the Jews were incapable of resistance, their houses of prayer were leveled with the ground, and the episcopal warrior, after rewarding his troops with the plunder of their goods, expelled from the city the remnant of the unbelieving nation. Some authors estimate that around 100,000 Jews were expelled from the city. The expulsion then continued in the nearby regions of Egypt and Palestine followed by a forced Christianization of the Jews. Arab rule 641 to 1250 Topic The Arab invasion of Egypt at first found support from Jewish residents as well disgruntled by the corrupt administration of the patriarch Cyrus of Alexandria notorious for his monothletic proselytizing In addition to the Jewish population settled there from ancient times some are said to have come from the Arabian Peninsula the letter sent by Muhammad to the Jewish Banu Janba in 630 is said by al-Baladari to have been seen in Egypt. 
A copy, written in Hebrew characters, has been found in the Cairo Geniza. Many Jewish residents had no reason to feel kindly toward the former masters of Egypt. In 629 the Emperor Heraclius I had driven the Jewish population from Jerusalem, and this was followed by massacres of Jewish residents throughout the empire, in Egypt, often aided by the Coptic population, who may have been trying to settle old grievances against Jewish groups, dating from the Persian conquest of Amida at the time of Emperor Anastasius I and of Alexandria by the Persian general Shahin Vimanzadagan when some of the Jewish residents sided with the conquerors. The Treaty of Alexandria November 8, 641, which sealed the Arab conquest of Egypt, expressly stipulated that the Jewish residents were to be allowed to remain in that city unmolested, and at the time of the capture of that city, Amr ibn al as, in his letter to the Caliph, relates that he found there 40,000 Jews, of the fortunes of the Jewish population of Egypt under the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphates 641-868, little is known. Under the Tulunids (863–905), the Karaite community enjoyed robust growth. Topic: <inaudible> Rule of the Fatimid Caliphs (969–1169). Topic: The rule of the Fatimid Caliphate was in general favorable for the Jewish communities, except the latter portion of Al Hakim by Amr Allah's reign. The foundation of Talmudic schools in Egypt is usually placed at this period. One of the Jewish citizens who rose to high position in that society was Yaqub ibn Kilis. The Caliph al-Hakim vigorously applied the Pact of Umar, and compelled the Jewish residents to wear bells and to carry in public the wooden image of a calf. A street in the city, al jadariya was designated for Jewish residency. Al-Hakim, hearing allegations that some mocked him in verses, had the whole quarter burned down. In the beginning of the 12th century a Jewish man named Abu al-Munajah ibn Shayya was at the head of the Department of Agriculture. He is especially known as the constructor of a Nile sluice 1112, which was called after him, Bar Abi al-Munajah. He fell into disfavor because of the heavy expenses connected with the work, and was incarcerated in Alexandria, but was soon able to free himself. A document concerning a transaction of his with a banker has been preserved. Under the vizier al-Malik al-Afdal 1137, there was a Jewish master of finances, whose name, however, is unknown. His enemies succeeded in procuring his downfall, and he lost all his property. He was succeeded by a brother of the Christian patriarch, who tried to drive the Jews out of the kingdom. Four leading Jews worked and conspired against the Christian, with what result is not known. There has been preserved a letter from this ex-minister to the Jews of Constantinople, begging for aid in a remarkably intricate poetical style. One of the physicians of the Caliph al-Hafiz was a Jew, Abu Mansur p. 306. Abu al-Fadayl ibn al died was a celebrated oculist. In this century a little more light is thrown upon the communities in Egypt through the reports of certain Jewish scholars and travelers who visited the country. Judah Halevi was in Alexandria in 1141, and dedicated some beautiful verses to his fellow resident and friend Aaron ben Zion ibn Alamani and his five sons. At Damietta Halevi met his friend, the Spaniard Abu Said ibn Hafan ha Levi. About 1160 Benjamin of Tadella was in Egypt, he gives a general account of the Jewish communities which he found there. At Cairo there were 2,000 Jews, at Alexandria 3,000, whose head was the French-born R. Phineas B. Meshulam, in the Fayyam there were 20 families, at Damietta 200, at Bilbais, east of the Nile, 300 persons, and at Demira 700. Topic. From Saladin and Maimonides 1169 to 1250. Topic. Saladin's war with the Crusaders 1169 does not seem to have affected the Jewish population with communal struggle. A Karaiti doctor, Abu al Bayan al Mudawar, d. 1184, who had been physician to the last Fatimid, treated Saladin also. Abu al Ma Ali, brother in law of Maimonides, was likewise in his service. 
In 1166, Maimonides went to Egypt and settled in Fastat, where he gained much renown as a physician, practicing in the family of Saladin and in that of his vizier al Qadi al Fadil, Qadi al Fadil al Baisami, and Saladin's successors. The title Ra is al Umma or al Mila, head of the nation or of the faith, was bestowed upon him. In Fastat he wrote his Mishnah Torah and the Guide for the Perplexed, both of which evoked opposition from Jewish scholars. From this place he sent many letters and responsa, and in 1173 he forwarded a request to the North African communities for help to secure the release of a number of captives. The original of the last document has been preserved. He caused the Karaites to be removed from the court. Mamluks Under the Bari Mamluks the Jews led a comparatively quiet existence, though they had at times to contribute heavily toward the maintenance of the vast military equipment, and were harassed by the Qadis and Alemas of these strict Muslims. Al Makrizi relates that the first great Mamluk, Sultan Bibers Al Malik Al Thahir, 1260–77, doubled the tribute paid by the Al Al Dima. At one time, he had resolved to burn all the Jews, a ditch having been dug for that purpose. But at the last moment, he repented and instead exacted a heavy tribute during the collection of which many perished. An account is given in Sambari 135:22 of the strictness with which the provisions of the Pact of Omar were carried out. The Sultan had just returned from a victorious campaign against the Mongols in Syria 1305. A convert from Judaism, Saw Id ibn Hassan of Alexandria, was incensed at the arrogance of the non-Muslim population, particularly at the open manner in which services were conducted in churches and synagogues. He tried to form a synod of ten rabbis, ten priests, and the ulemas. Failing in this, he endeavored to have the churches and synagogues closed. Some of the churches were demolished by Alexandrian mobs, but most of the synagogues were allowed to stand, as it was shown that they had existed at the time of Omar, and were by the pact exempted from interference. Sambari says that a new pact was made at the instance of letters from a Moorish king of Barcelona 1309, and the synagogues were reopened, but this probably refers only to the reissuing of the pact of Omar. There are extant several notable fatwas responsa of Muslim doctors touching this subject, e.g., those of Ahmad ibn Abd al-Haq, who speaks especially of the synagogues at Cairo, which on the outside appeared like ordinary dwelling houses, a fact which had occasioned other legal writers to permit their presence. According to Taqi al-Din ibn Taymiyyah b. 1263, the synagogues and churches in Cairo had once before been closed. He filled his fatwas with invectives against the Jews, holding that all their religious edifices ought to be destroyed, since they had been constructed during a period when Cairo was in the hands of heterodox Muslim, Ismailians, Karmatians, and Nusiris. The synagogues were, however, allowed to stand. Under the same Sultan 1324, the Jews were accused of incendiarism at Fastat and Cairo, they had to exculpate themselves by a payment of 50,000 gold pieces. Under the Burji Mamluks the Franks again attacked Alexandria 1416, and the laws against Jewish customs were once more strictly enforced by Sheikh al-Mu'ayyid 1421, by Ashraf Bars Bey 1422-38, by Al-Zahir Jakmak 1438-53, and by Ka'it Bey 1468 The last named is referred to by Obadiah of Bertinoro o. P. 53. The Jewish community of Cairo was compelled to pay 75,000 gold pieces. Ottoman rule on January 22, 1517, the Ottoman Sultan, Selim I, defeated Chuman Bey, the last of the Mamluks. He made radical changes in the governance of the Jewish community, abolishing the office of Najid, making each community independent, and placing David ibn Abi Zimra, at the head of that of Cairo. He also appointed Abraham de Castro to be master of the mint. 
It was during the reign of Salim's successor, Suleiman II, that Ahmad Pasha, viceroy of Egypt, revenged himself upon the Jews because de Castro had revealed 1524 to the Sultan his designs for independence. See Ahmad Pasha, Abraham de Castro. The Cairo Purim, in commemoration of their escape, is still celebrated on Adar 28. Toward the end of the 16th century Talmudic studies in Egypt were greatly fostered by Bezalil Ashkenazi, author of the Shitta Mechabezit. Among his pupils were Isaac Luria, who as a young man had gone to Egypt to visit a rich uncle, the tax farmer Mordecai Francis Azulai, Shem ha Gedalim, number 332, and Abraham Monson 1594. Ishmael Cohen Tanuji finished his Sefer Ha Zikaran in Egypt in 1543. Joseph ben Moses D. Trani was in Egypt for a time, Frumkin, L. C. p. 69, as well as Chaim Vital Aaron ibn Chaim, the biblical and Talmudical commentator, 1609, Frumkin, L. C. pp. 71, 72. Of Isaac Luria's pupils, a Joseph Taboul is mentioned, whose son Jacob, a prominent man, was put to death by the authorities. According to Manasseh b. Israel, 1656, the viceroy of Egypt has always at his side a Jew with the title Zaref Bashi, or treasurer, who gathers the taxes of the land. At present Abraham Alkula holds the position. He was succeeded by Raphael Joseph T. Shelebi, the rich friend and protector of Shabbatai Zevi. Shabbatai was twice in Cairo, the second time in 1660. It was there that he married the ill-famed Sarah, who had been brought from Leghorn Livorno. The Shabbatayan movement naturally created a great stir in Egypt. It was in Cairo that Miguel Abraham Cardozo, the Shabbatayan prophet and physician, settled 1703, becoming physician to the Pasha Kara Muhammad. In 1641 Samuel B. David, Karaiti, visited Egypt. The account of his journey G. I. 1. supplies special information in regard to his fellow sectaries. He describes three synagogues of the rabbinates at Alexandria, and two at Rashid G. I. 4. A second Karaiti, Moses ben Elijah ha Levi, has left a similar account of the year 1654, but it contains only a few points of special interest to the Karaites Ib. Sambari mentions a severe trial which came upon the Jews, due to a certain Qadi al Asakir equals Generalissimo not a proper name, sent from Constantinople to Egypt, who robbed and oppressed them, and whose death was in a certain measure occasioned by the graveyard invocation of one Moses of Damwa. This may have occurred in the 17th century s. 120, 21. David Conforte was Dayan in Egypt in 1671. Blood libels occurred at Alexandria in 1844, in 1881, and in Jan, 1902. In consequence of the Damascus affair, Moses Montefior, Cremieu, and Solomon Monk visited Egypt in 1840, and the last two did much to raise the intellectual status of their Egyptian brethren by the founding, in connection with Rabbi Moses Joseph Algazi, of schools in Cairo. At the turn of the 20th century, a Jewish observer noted with true satisfaction that a great spirit of tolerance sustains the majority of our fellow Jews in Egypt, and it would be difficult to find a more liberal population or one more respectful of all religious beliefs. According to the official census published in 1898, I, XVIII, there were in Egypt 25,200 Jews in a total population of 9,734,405. Topic. Modern times since 1919. Topic. Topic. Since 1919. Topic. During British rule, and under King Fuad I, Egypt was friendly towards its Jewish population although between 86% and 94% of Egyptian Jews did not possess Egyptian nationality whether they had been denied it or opted not to apply. Jews played important roles in the economy, and their population climbed to nearly 80,000 as Jewish refugees settled there in response to increasing persecution in Europe. Many Jewish families, such as the Katawi family, had extensive economic relations with non Jews. A sharp distinction had long existed between the respective Karaiti and Rabbinite communities, among whom traditionally intermarriage was forbidden. They dwelt in Cairo in two contiguous areas, the former in the Harat al Yahud al Karin, and the latter in the adjacent Harat al Yahud quarter. 
Notwithstanding the division, they often worked together and the younger educated generation pressed for improving relations between the two. Individual Jews played an important role in Egyptian nationalism. René Katawi, leader of the Cairo Sephardi community, endorsed the creation in 1935 of the Association of Egyptian Jewish Youth, with its slogan, "'Egypt is our homeland, Arabic is our language.'" Katawi strongly opposed political Zionism and wrote a note on "'The Jewish Question' to the World Jewish Congress in 1943 in which he argued that Palestine would be unable to absorb Europe's Jewish refugees. Nevertheless, various wings of the Zionist movement had representatives in Egypt. Karaiti Jewish scholar Murad Farag (1866–1956) was both an Egyptian nationalist and a passionate Zionist. His poem, "My Homeland Egypt, Place of My Birth," expresses loyalty to Egypt, while his book Al Kudsiyat (1923) defends the right of the Jews to a state. Al Kudsiyat is perhaps the most eloquent defense of Zionism in the Arabic language. Murad Farag was also one of the co-authors of Egypt's first constitution in 1923. Another famous Egyptian Jew of this period was Yaqub Sanu, who became a patriotic Egyptian nationalist advocating the removal of the British. He edited the nationalist publication Abu Nadera, Azra from Exile. This was one of the first magazines written in Egyptian Arabic, and mostly consisted of satire, poking fun at the British as well as the ruling Muhammad Ali dynasty, seen as puppets of the British. Another was Henri Curiel, who founded the Egyptian Movement for National Liberation in 1943, an organization that was to form the core of the Egyptian Communist Party. Curiel was later to play an important role in establishing early informal contacts between the PLO and Israel. In 1937, the Egyptian government annulled the capitulations, which gave foreign nationals a virtual status of exterritoriality. The minority groups affected were mainly from Syria, Greece, and Italy, ethnic Armenians, and some Jews who were nationals of other countries. The foreign nationals' immunity from taxation had given the minority groups trading within Egypt highly favorable advantages. Many European Jews used Egyptian banks as a vehicle for transferring money from Central Europe, not least those Jews escaping the fascist regimes. In addition to this, many Jewish people living in Egypt were known to possess foreign citizenship, while those possessing Egyptian citizenship often had extensive ties to European countries. The impact of the well-publicized Arab-Jewish clash in Palestine from 1936 to 1939, together with the rise of Nazi Germany, also began to affect the Jewish relations with Egyptian society, despite the fact that the number of active Zionists in their ranks was small. The rise of local militant nationalistic societies like Young Egypt and the Society of Muslim Brothers, who were sympathetic to the various models evinced by the Axis powers in Europe, and organized themselves along similar lines, were also increasingly antagonistic to Jews. Groups including the Muslim Brotherhood circulated reports in Egyptian mosques and factories claiming that Jews and the British were destroying holy places in Jerusalem, as well as sending other false reports stating that hundreds of Arab women and children were being killed. Much of the antisemitism of the 1930s and 1940s was fueled by a close association between Hitler's new regime in Germany and anti-imperialist Arab powers. One of these Arab authorities was Haj Amin al-Husseini, who was influential in securing Nazi funds that were appropriated to the Muslim Brotherhood for the operation of a printing press for the distribution of thousands of anti-Semitic propaganda pamphlets. By the 1940s, the situation worsened. Sporadic pogroms took place in 1942 onwards. The Jewish quarter of Cairo was severely damaged in the 1945 Cairo pogrom. As the partition of Palestine and the founding of Israel drew closer, hostility towards the Egyptian Jews strengthened, fed also by press attacks on all foreigners accompanying the rising ethnocentric nationalism of the age. In 1947, the company laws set quotas for employing Egyptian nationals in incorporated firms, requiring that 75% of salaried employees, and 90% of all workers, must be Egyptian. As Jews were denied citizenship as a rule, this constrained Jewish and foreign-owned entrepreneurs to reduce recruitment for employment positions from their own ranks. The law also required that just over half of the paid-up capital of joint stock companies be Egyptian. The Egyptian Prime Minister Nukrashi told the British ambassador, All Jews were potential Zionists and Anyhow all Zionists were communists. 
On 24 November 1947, the head of the Egyptian delegation to the UN General Assembly, Mohammed Hussein Haikal Pasha, said that the lives of one million Jews in Muslim countries would be jeopardized by the establishment of a Jewish state. On 24 November 1947, Dr. Haikal Pasha said, if the UN decide to amputate a part of Palestine in order to establish a Jewish state, Jewish blood will necessarily be shed elsewhere in the Arab world, to place in certain and serious danger a million Jews. Mahmoud Bey Fazi Egypt said. Imposed partition was sure to result in bloodshed in Palestine and in the rest of the Arab world. After the foundation of Israel in 1948 After the foundation of Israel in 1948, and the subsequent 1948 Arab–Israeli War, in which Egypt participated, difficulties multiplied for Egyptian Jews, who then numbered 75,000. That year, bombings of Jewish areas killed 70 Jews and wounded nearly 200, while riots claimed many more lives. During the Arab–Israeli War, the famous Sakharel department store near Cairo's Opera Square was firebombed. The government helped with funds to rebuild it, but it was again burnt down in 1952, and eventually passed into Egyptian control. As a result, many Egyptian Jews emigrated abroad. By 1950, nearly 40% of Egypt's Jewish population had emigrated. About 14,000 of them went to Israel, and the rest to other countries. The 1954 Levant Affair was an Israeli sabotage operation designed to discredit and overthrow the then Egyptian president Gamal Abdel Nasser and to end secret negotiations with Egypt being pursued by then Israeli Prime Minister Moshe Sherat, who did not know nor approve of the operation. Sherat did not learn of the truth before he had denounced the charges by the Egyptian government in a speech in the Knesset as a blood libel, which caused him to feel deep humiliation that he had lied to the world and was one factor in Sherat's resignation as prime minister. The operation also blew up Western targets, without causing deaths, led to deeper distrust of Jews, from whose community key agents in the operation had been recruited and led to sharply increased emigration of Jews from Egypt. In his summing up statement Fuad al-Digwi, the prosecutor at their trial, repeated the official government stance, the Jews of Egypt are living among us and are sons of Egypt. Egypt makes no difference between its sons whether Muslims, Christians, or Jews. These defendants happen to be Jews who reside in Egypt, but we are trying them because they committed crimes against Egypt, although they are Egypt. S. Sons, though not one person was killed in the Levan affair, two members of the ring, Dr. Musa Marzouk and Shmuel Azar, received a death sentence. By contrast, six members from Dr. Marzouk's extended family were killed in the 1948 massacres, and yet no one was arrested. In 1953, a cousin of Dr. Marzouk, Kamal Masuda, was killed, and the authorities did not make arrests. Other members of the sabotage rings had families who lost their livelihood after the notorious 1947 company law was implemented. In the immediate aftermath of trilateral invasion during the Suez Crisis of 1956, on November 23 by Britain France and Israel, a proclamation was issued stating that, "...all Jews are Zionists and enemies of the state," and it promised that they would be soon expelled. Some 25,000 Jews, almost half of the Jewish community left for Israel, Europe, the United States and South America, after being forced to sign declarations that they were leaving voluntarily, and agreed with the confiscation of their assets. Some 1,000 more Jews were imprisoned. Similar measures were enacted against British and French nationals in retaliation for the invasion. In Joel Bainan's summary. Between 1919 and 1956, the entire Egyptian Jewish community, like the Sakharel firm, was transformed from a national asset into a fifth column. After 1956, prominent families, like the Qadawi, were left with only a fraction of the social clout they had once enjoyed, if they could remain in Egypt at all. Ironically Jews like René Qadawi were in full support of establishing an Arab-Egyptian nationalism, and were opposed to the rise of Zionism and the establishment of the State of Israel. Nonetheless, even this social elite of the Jewish population was not believed to have any place in the new Egyptian regime. 
Among those Jews deported, Dr. Raymond F. Shinazi who was born in Alexandria left Egypt with his family to an Italian refugee camp at the age of 13. Later on, Dr. Shinazi working for Gilead Sciences, agreed to provide Egypt with the drug Sovaldi at $300 which is only 1% of its market price. In Egypt, there is currently a total of around 12 million Egyptians infected with hepatitis C. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, August Lindt stated in his report to the UNREF Executive Committee's fourth session Geneva the 29th of January to the 4th of February 1957 Another emergency problem is now arising, that of refugees from Egypt. There is no doubt in my mind that those refugees from Egypt who are not able, or not willing to avail themselves of the protection of the government of their nationality fall under the mandate of my office, the last chief rabbi of Egypt was Chaim Musa Duek, who served from 1960 until he left Egypt in 1972. After the Six-Day War in 1967, more confiscations took place. Rami Mangobi, who lived in Cairo at the time, states that nearly all Egyptian Jewish men between the ages of 17 and 60 were either thrown out of the country immediately, or taken to the detention centers of Abu Zaabal and Tura, where they were incarcerated and tortured for more than three years. The eventual result was the almost complete disappearance of the 3,000 year old Jewish community in Egypt. The vast majority of Jews left the country. Most Egyptian Jews fled to Israel, 35,000, Brazil, 15,000, France, 10,000, the U.S., 9,000, and Argentina. 9, A letter published by the Jerusalem Post from Dr. Ejan, of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, stated, I refer to our recent discussion concerning Jews from Middle Eastern and North African countries in consequence of recent events. I am now able to inform you that such persons may be considered prima facie within the mandate of this office. According to a 2009 report by the Anti Defamation League, anti Semitic and anti Israel sentiments continue to run high. Israel and Zionism are frequently associated with conspiracy theories of subverting and weakening the state. The last Jewish wedding in Egypt took place in 1984. The Jewish population of Egypt was estimated at less than 200 in 2007, less than 40 in 2014, and as of 2017, is estimated at 18 6 in Cairo, 12 in Alexandria. Marriage restriction has caused many members to convert to other religions, mainly Jewish women who convert to Islam, due to being married to Egyptian Muslim men. Because a Jewish man cannot marry an Egyptian Muslim woman, but an Egyptian Muslim man may marry a Jewish woman, the community has lost many male members who are no longer Jewish on official documents. Topic works by Egyptian Jews on their communities Topic Matalan, Ranit. Zay I'm ha Panam Elenu The One Facing Us Novel of Life in an Egyptian Jewish Family. Masriya Pseudonym of Gisele Littman, Bat Yeor, Yaadia 1974 1971, in the Hebrew trans, Yehude Mitzrayim, ed. Les Juifs en Egypte, Aperçu sur 3000 ans de Histoire Editions de l'Avenir ed. Geneva, the author is called Bat Yeor. Taboul, Victor 2002. Editions Les Intouchables, ed. La Lente Découverte de la Trangete. Montreal. Lucette Lagnado. The Man in the White Sharkskin Suit, an autobiography of a Jewish family during their years in Egypt and after they emigrated to the United States Mangobi, Rami, May 31, 2007. My Longest Ten Minutes. The Jerusalem Post Magazine. A Cairo Jewish Boyhood During and After the Six-Day War. Asiman, Andre, 1994. Out of Egypt. Picador. Carasso, Lucien 2014. Growing Up Jewish in Alexandria, The Story of a Sephardic Family's Exodus from Egypt. New York. Mizrahi, Dr. Maurice M. 2004. Growing Up Under Pharaoh. Mizrahi, Dr. Maurice M. 2012. History of the Jews of Egypt, PDF. Damond, Lilian 2007. The Lost World of the Egyptian Jews, First Person Accounts from Egypt's Jewish Community in the 20th Century, Oral History Project based on interviews with more than two dozen exiled Egyptian Jews Tabool, Ph.D., Victor. Revisiting Tolerance. Lessons Drawn from Egypt's Cosmopolitan Heritage. 
Topic see also topic topic Ancient history topic Elephantine papyri Jewish temple at Elephantine land of Onias Philo topic Modern history topic History of the Jews under Muslim rule Suez Crisis Egypt Israel Peace Treaty Jewish Exodus from Arab and Muslim countries 1956-57 Exodus and expulsions from Egypt Operation Goshen Mizrahi Jews in Israel Jews of Egypt film Palash family topic Institutions topic List of synagogues in Egypt Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo Eliyahu Hanavi Synagogue in Alexandria Sha'ar Hashamiyam Synagogue in Cairo Tomb of Rabbi Yaakov Abuhatzerah in Damanhur Cairo Geniza Topic References Topic This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Singer, Isidore, et al., eds. 1901-1906. Egypt. Jewish Encyclopedia. New York, Funk & Wagnalls Company. The Works of Josephus, Complete and Unabridged, New Updated Edition Translated by William Whiston, A. M. Peabody, Massachusetts, Hendrickson Publishers, 1987 5th Printing, Jan. 1991, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 12, Chapters 1 and 2, pp. 308-9. Earlier edition available at https colon slash slash www.scribd.com slash doc slash two seven oh nine seven six one four slash Josephus dash complete dash works. Gudrun Kramer, The Jews in Modern Egypt, nineteen fourteen to nineteen fifty two, Seattle, University of Washington Press, nineteen eighty nine. Murad L. K. O. D. S. I., The Karaiti Jews of Egypt, 1882-1986, Lyons, N. Y., Willprint, 1987. External links Bassettine News, the only Jewish newsletter reporting directly from Egypt Jewish Virtual Library Historical Society of Jews from Egypt a Jewish Refugee Answers Middle East Times, October 30, 2004. The International Association of Jews from Egypt Jews expelled from Egypt left behind a piece of their hearts Briefly investigating the origin of the ancient Jewish community at Elephantine, a review Egyptian Jews look back with anger, love Guernica magazine Guernica .com on the last Jews of Cairo Bainan, Joel, The Dispersion of Egyptian Jewry Culture, Politics, and the Formation of a Modern Diaspora Berkeley, University of California Press, 1998. Amer Univ in Cairo PR, 2005, ISBN 977-424-890-2 Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa A Family's Exodus from Cairo to the New World. Lucette Lagnado Remembers Her Childhood Out of Egypt Jewish writer reviews his diary and a wonderful book is born 1. Zeva Olbaum photographs at the American Sephardi Federation, including photos taken of Jewish communities in Alexandria and Cairo in 1976 openly available to view online.